Vancouver, uh, and he's been for almost 50% of his life working on face transitions. Uh, he's worked on invar, anti-invar alloys, he's worked on oysters, shape memory, uh, he's worked on anti perovskites all kinds of systems that show face transitions. Okay, and not only that, uh, he has shown that how face transitions can can be used for applications. The recent ones are the quote unquote shell magnets and polar magnets. And uh, the previous to that was inverse magnetocaloric effect. All these are have a lot of potential application. And what he is going to do over the next two weeks is uh, perhaps going to take you over this journey of how these transitions can be realized in experiments, what fun you can have with it. I am told that he's going, going to have lots of demonstrations. So you should be interactive. Let's have these interact sessions interactive. Grab as much as you can. He's here. And uh, I hope uh, you have this course, a fruitful course, and you take home something with you when you go back. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, course, which we'll be going through together for the next two weeks. We'll see how things go on. Um, this is a, uh, well, um, I would like to first thank Karl Stoop um, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here and to present these lectures. It's been a very, very, very long time since I've lectured. <laughs> And um, so, um, going back and st starting to, uh, uh, yeah, it's okay, um, to prepare things. Of course, uh, uh, what you think that you will be talking about in the beginning uh, changes about every week. And in the course of the months and things like that, the original program has sort of shifted and moved around. And um, so you've sort of added uh, new topics and things like that to these. Um, as a, um, let's try. <clears throat> so as a title, um, what I finally sort of thought would be appropriate to present you here would be something under phase transitions for technological applications. <clears throat> now, uh, many of you, most of you, if not all of you, have taken courses in thermodynamics. You've seen all sorts of formalism on phase transitions and things. And you probably know a lot better than me now. I have to go back and refresh all these things if, if I really were to. Um, so um, what I would like to <clears throat> present here are mostly, if not strictly, uh, experimental aspects of phase transitions, how these phase transitions can be exploited for various kinds of applications and so on. So, um, right at the beginning, um, I would like to sort of um, give you an idea of what the schedule uh, is or what I have in mind. Um, these are, of course, subject to some alterations in the course of this time. But um, starting with today, I would like to show you, uh, I'll give you an introduction on the functionalities of phase transitions. And the best example for this is the shape memory effect. And along with the shape memory effect, I have a few demonstrations here. And just want to recapitulate a few things on nucleation and growth because uh, most of these things are what I am, will be talking about in the course of the, uh, of the two weeks uh, will be on solid-solid uh, phase transitions. And basically these solid-solid phase transitions, um, <clears throat> when they are um, structural phase transitions, they do uh, show a nucleation and growth process. Other than that, we have phase separations, which is, of course, um, some other kind of a nucleation growth in one sense, but it's mostly all first-order transitions. Now, um, there are things 
that we always take for granted. Um, people tell us that the order of this transition is first, the order of the other transition is second, and then um, we get all sorts of discrepancies with experiments and things. So uh, while we have learned a lot from the formalism of what first phase, first order transitions, what second phase order transitions are, when you actually do the experiment and when you look, um, there may be, and there are, um, quite a lot of deviations from this concept of order. We'll be going into that as well. So uh, tomorrow uh, I will be talking about uh, magnetic shape memory. <clears throat> um, this is the magnetic version of the shape memory effect, which I will be uh, demonstrating over here as well. Um, to talk about that, I just want to go into a little bit of formalism of generalized fields and responses. With a generalized field, we mean um, you can have a magnetic field, you can have a stress field, you can have an electric field, you can have all sorts of fields which are applied, and then you have responses. And then you can generalize these under one field and one response. <clears throat> Um, the magnetic shape memory, the prototype of that uh, is, a, is nickel manganese gallium. Uh, so I'll give you some uh, ideas of what this magnetic shape memory um, alloys are like. And in the course of looking for other magnetic shape memory alloys, we have come across um, many other interesting functional functionalities in Hoistler's, not in nickel manganese gallium, but um, when you change the uh, the gallium element, the, uh, the main group element into aluminum, indium, tin, antimony. You get all sorts of other effects as well. <clears throat> so then um, another basic functionality, um, which, which has become basic, is because everybody's uh, studying this, are magnetocaloric effects. Magnetocaloric effects. So what it is, you basically apply a magnetic field onto something, magnetic and the, uh, the temperature changes and you want to build a refrigerator out of that. That's the object, of course. And this is actually being done. It has been done. Uh, there are prototypes which actually work as well, but there's still a long way to go concerning materials, heat transfer and all these things. Um, here I will be sort of talking about magnetocaloric effects in relation to uh, the, um, uh, the transitions. So, um, the first problem that you come across with when you're dealing with magnetocaloric effects, shape memory effects, and those things, is the hysteresis that you have at first order transitions, the thermal hysteresis. So, the, the paths don't follow each other. And the problem is, how do you deal with this hysteresis? Uh, how would you live with this hysteresis? And how do things work around when you have hysteresis, which paths are followed by entropy changes and so on so that you know exactly where you are, what you're having um, and to what extent and how can you narrow the hysteresis if, if possible at all. So then we come to Friday, then um, we come to, um, I hope to come to, <laughs> uh, some other kind of functionalities and um, taking the advantage of the decomposition process which is also a first order transition in one sense um, you can build functionalities and you can do these in nanoparticles and I'd like to show you here what happens when we have segregation effects uh, and decomposition uh, at the nanoscale and how we build um, composites of materials uh, at the nanoscale. So then uh, next week um, I'm coming into something more classical. And the reason is that it's probably it's classical, but I think it's the most important part of this lecture. It's not the most fun, I'll tell you about that. It's the anti-invar to invar problem. Now, um, many of you are 
um, will be working experimentally, I suppose, uh, in the field of hoistlers, steels, and whatnot. But whatever you're working on usually contains iron or manganese. And iron and manganese are two unstable elements. Not that they decay radioactively, they're magnetically unstable. And that is why their diversity um, is observed. I mean, they, they come into everything. They come into ferritic steels, as austenitic steels, and when you come into manganese, you have the hoistlers, you have uh, antiperovskites, you have plictides, you have, uh, what else, silicides and manganites, you have everything. And um, iron and manganese, they're neighboring elements, and they have very similar properties, but at different scales. And um, when I first came to Germany, we were working on the INVAR problem. And I was uh, working with this uh, elderly man at that time who was just as old as I am now. <laughs> and, uh, um, and he had uh, a tremendous amount of experience uh, in these things. And we set everything aside and said, let's try to understand iron first. And if you understand iron, you understand everything after that. Honestly, it's true. I mean, iron is one element in the periodic sense. If you understand that, then you know what you're dealing with when you have composites, when you have applications, when you have things. And uh, that's a, um, that's a, it's, it's a missing, um, um, I, th I think it is, it's, it's a missing concept or it's a missing um, culture um, in um, people who are trained to work in these areas. I mean, it would be very, very much more helpful if, if one would know what's going on behind um, all the experiments and things that you are doing. Why is manganese all of a sudden antiferromagnetic? Does iron become antiferromagnetic? Well, it does. Anyhow. So uh, that takes us on to um, Wednesday and Thursday. Now, here I wanted to see if this would work out. Um, I understand that uh, many of you will be working on some hoister or hoister-like materials. And what happens in, the, um, in these materials is that we have um, some crystallographic configurations. Uh, we call them martensite. But, um, yeah, we call them martensite, but there are so many of them. And it turns out that uh, these... Um, crystallographic phases have modulated structures. <clears throat> and to deal with these structures, when you do x-ray experiments and you try to understand what your structure is like, um, you have to be able to deal with modulated structures. And I was thinking that maybe we could do something interactive. Uh, all you have to do is, uh, there's this program called YANA 2006, which can handle these modulated structures. And we can do some examples over there in these things together, uh, perhaps in groups and things like that. So uh, it's very easy. It's, it's available. Uh, you just, I'll, I'll show you that. I'll give you the, uh, the links and things. You can put it into your computer. And there are um, many examples that we have worked out. Well, they're not examples, actually. They were uh, the, um, uh, the materials which we were working with. Uh, so uh, uh, we know what's going to come out at the end. Uh, more or less. Um, so that would be, um, uh, let's see, let's see how, how it's going to be, how, we, how uh, uh, first will we get there. So on, on Friday then I was thinking of um, doing some kind of a review of what we've learned over here, sort of recapulate um, um, uh, whether, um, whether the whole thing was worth it or not or something. Uh, anyhow, I mean, uh, what, uh, what is, Perhaps you will have uh, learned that you would, you may want to take back home. <clears throat> so um, now, before going any further, um, what I would like to show you is what we're going to be talking about. So you'll see it first, and then we'll do the explanation later on. Okay? So uh, now, can you hear me when I talk like this? Because uh, I think it's going to be difficult to try to be as loud as possible. So um, I have here a few examples of shape memory materials. So a shape <laughs> memory material is a material that has a high temperature 
crystallographic phase and a low temperature crystallographic phase. So high temperature we call it austenite, and low temperature we call it marginalite. Okay? If you have these two phases, then you have a chance of having a shape memory material. So, um, this here is a fascinating piece of wire. It's this nickel titanium. Tell you about the history of this in a little while. Okay? So, but um, this is now in the martensite phase. So if I take this and if I warm it, it's going to go into the austenite phase. And it's going to remember the shape that it was in in its previous life. Okay? So this turns into a paper clip. I'll see. Yeah. So it was a paper, and right now I can't do it. I, I, if it's warm, then you see I cannot um, kind of uh, I can't deform it anymore. It has to get cold again. And once it's cold, then it's, it's then you can play around, and then when you heat it back up. It'll take its original shape. This is. This is shape time. You have shape memory in nickel titanium, what else? Gold cadmium, copper manganese, uh, sorry, copper, copper zinc aluminum, all sorts of other things. Iron rhodium, iron palladium. You get you get it in many things. Um, the one of the most important things is that or the one of the most interesting things is that in these transitions, or in these well, when, when you have the shape memory effect, um, the transition takes place such that there is very little or hardly any volume change. Okay? So when you go from one crystallographic state to the other crystallographic state, you have a minimum of the volume change. Because if you have a large volume change, then you're going to have all sorts of strains over there and uh, things are not going to be well, not, not going to work. They're not going to be they're reversible in a sense. So that is mostly um, a condition. Now this now here are two things. They look very similar. Okay? So this is just a simple brass. It's copper zinc. And if I bend this, it's not going to do anything. It's bent. It's gone. Okay? So it's just bent. This is a material that has the same color. But it just has the same color. If I bend this, let it loose, it goes back. Okay? If I bend this, you see? And it goes back again. Maybe you can do this many, many times. This is a single crystal of um, Copper, zinc, uh, aluminum. Okay. This was grown in Bariloche, South America. So you see here that uh, well, they have the same thickness, but if you have a regular material, I mean, just, just do anything with this thing, it bends. It bends back and forth. And the reason why it bends back and forth is that I'll show you that in more detail is that you go from um, one crystallographic state uh, to another when you bend the thing. So under stress, you induce the martensite phase. Instead of changing the temperature, now you, you do this with, uh, uh, with, with stress. When you release the stress, of course, the thermodynamic stable state is a high temperature state, so it 
goes back again. Now, to give you an idea of what the uh, what the forces are, uh, what, what what kind of forces are involved in this whole thing, and uh, um, to see for what they can be useful, um, we have here a spring. Okay. So this spring, oh, you can do it, you can, you can ruin it, okay? You can bend it. Yeah. Now, you can even make it a spring. So, we have a little table here. Okay. Let's see. And we're going to put something on that. I was thinking of putting the stool on top of that upside down. I think it'll work. I brought my own torch. So, I think the airlines. Uh, I think this could work. Let's see. Anyhow. So, what I'm doing right now is I'm heating the material. This thing is going up. Can you see it all? When this thing cools down, of course, um, it'll go back down. But I'll just take it down myself, just in case something happens. <laughs> okay. So, uh, by the end of the course, it'll cool down and we'll have something else. So, now, um, it's very interesting that these very uh, useful and nice phenomena um, have been mostly encountered by um, chance, and a lot of them. And there's a very interesting story of the nickel-titanium alloys, and there's a very interesting story behind um, nickel-manganese gallium, the magnetic shape memory as well. So, um, the, um, uh, the nickel-titanium alloys, uh, the uh, the development of nickel titanium alloys was basically uh, the, the, the motivation behind that was to um, uh, provide some kind of a material that uh, had um, very uh, strong heat resistance and impact and fatigue properties. Um, <clears throat> Resistance against these properties, and these were for the subrock uh, subrocks was below the surface launch missile um, rockets of the U.S. Navy, the, the Polaris missiles, or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So then they came back down; they could be recovered and things. And um, um, so people went around and um, uh, at the Naval Ordnance Laboratories, and uh, they collected some. Um, data on materials which perhaps could have these uh, interesting properties or these, uh, these desired properties. And um, so they eliminated all points of alloys and among them, one nickel titanium, um, it showed that it had a, a very good impact resistance. Um, what people did was they 
prepared a series of alloys and uh, started uh, to ch check their acoustic properties, actually. Uh, the um, one thing about nickel titanium was that in a range of compositions, the people who prepared this alloy, it was uh, William Bühler, um, he intentionally dropped it or hit the alloys that, um, that he prepared. And they all had ringing sounds except for one composition which had a lead-like sound, okay? It made a thud. It didn't ring. And um, they thought that they had some metallurgical problems and things like that in the beginning. Uh, but then, uh, looking at it more closely, everything was okay, and they realized that this particular material uh, had very interesting uh, elastic uh, properties. So then, there was further research on this, and of course people um, started drawing wires and um, uh, looking at other properties, but when you look at the original uh, preparation of the alloy, uh, it was, was in 1958, 1959, around that time when this alloy was discovered. Um, it took about another four years, uh, sometime around in 1961, 1962 or something like that. Um, somebody was giving a lecture like me here and had a piece of this wire and they passed it around everywhere. And um, so it came to this guy who was a pipe smoker and um, David Muzzy and she lit a lighter, and suddenly, bang, there was a, the, the, the wire was straight, and um, nobody knew, nobody understood what it was about. I mean, it was really, uh, uh, because it was a very nice material, you can bend it back and forth, do all sorts of things. But then, of course, it became clear um, after a while that um, we were dealing with um, two different crystallographic uh, phases. But, um, like I say, it's um, uh, coincidences and uh, uh, these uh, uh, little timely, so to speak, uh, interventions <laughs> um, uh, lead to some interesting results. I mean, if you got, if like I wasn't a pipe smoker, it may have, may have taken another two years until we found another pipe smoker or something. Yeah. Um, so um, this was the discovery of the shape memory effect, 1961. So it's about, about three years before. Uh, in magnetic shape memory, it's worse. It's about 50 years until they realize that nickel manganese gallium <coughs> uh, undergoes a martensitic transition, and by the time that somebody decides to apply a magnetic field, uh, that's that's a long time. But I'll tell you about that later on. So now, um, when we're dealing with uh, martensitic transitions, um, we uh, have uh, um, a first order transition. And in first order transitions, we usually have uh, hysteresis. There are certain uh, things that we uh, refer to uh, concerning the transitions. Before that, I just want to tell you where this thing about martensite and austenite comes from. It comes from two people. Yeah? So, uh, Adolf Karl Gottfried Martens, he was a metallurgist, and um, he developed the uh, metallographic microscope. So when you make a microscope like that, you put everything underneath it, what you have, and then, uh, of course, they put in steels. And he realized these, uh, he found these structures coming out, what we know today as martensitic structures. At that time, of course, they didn't have any photography or anything, so that they had to draw everything they saw by hand. And it's remarkable. And these, oh, if you go into the old literature and things, you have these huge um, uh, 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 annexes in, uh, in, these, in these articles where people have drawn by hands what they have seen. And they're very close to the micros microscope images of today as well. So that's why um, what the low temperature state, for some reason, was attributed to him. Uh, of his name. And the uh, uh, Austin, William Chandler Roberts Austin, he was a, uh, a metallurgist. Um, and how exactly he got his name on this, I don't know. Uh, but uh, uh, that he's, it's, it's named after him. 
So then we have the, uh, the ver if, if we measure um, any quantity such as strain or resistivity and plot that out as a, uh, uh, the temperature dependence of the resistivity as we have over here. Uh, cursor comes out. Yeah. So we have here the temperature dependence of the resistivity and we go through the transition. So if we come from high temperature, MS is referred to the Martensite start temperature and MF uh, refers to the Martensite finish temperature. So um, everything doesn't happen at one temperature. So you have a, a range, a rather narrow range where you have coexisting phases and you have to go down well below MF until you have something, a pure Martensite state. Now these temperatures, um, when you do an experiment, when you try to measure these temperatures and things, I mean, it's always a question, so how do you define these temperatures? At what point can I, with that MS, should I define that as the inflection point? Should I go higher, should I go lower? Certain things are, uh, are left to you actually. There is no uh, definite rule. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's more intuitive. We look at these figures, well, you say this thing starts going down, so it's MS. Uh, but if you look closely, actually, things start going on a little bit higher than that, uh, so where is MS and things like that. So don't worry when people are arguing about the positions of temperatures. It's all a lie. I mean, it's, uh, so you have to, uh, there, is no, um, there is no precise method of uh, knowing the exact temperature. It's not really necessary either. So when you're going back up in temperature, we've gone down to below MF, and now we're going to go above MF. Uh, we're going to increase the temperature from below MF to above MF. Uh, um, it doesn't follow the same path. Okay. Now this is the hysteresis that we have that is involved in these first order transitions. So you, uh, when you're increasing the temperature, uh, you You see my, oh, the cursor's there. Yeah, okay, I can use this. Device. So we come from a temperature down here. We go up. Um, the system still remains in the Martensite state for a long time. And until it reaches a temperature somewhere around here, which is called the austenite start temperature. And uh, then it goes up back again, and then uh, it comes to a point where things are reversible if you go up and down in temperature. And AF is the on-site final temperature. So, um, these are the basic uh, parameters that we have uh, that uh, describe these transitions. This um, is a piece of data that gives you an idea of what the width of the transitions can be. Okay, so we have here two things. We have iron nickel. You can you can have all sorts of iron manganese. You can have iron carbon. You can have all sorts of other things. Uh, this is a seventy thirty, seventy thirty iron nickel, and you can see here that the martensitic transition temperature, the width of the martensitic transition, is tremendous. Uh, it's huge. So you have the MS temperature at 243 Kelvin. You've got to go well below this, I suppose, and then when you go back up again. So the austenite start temperature is over here. And the difference sort of defines the width of the hysteresis. And what do you have here? You have a hysteresis width of about 400 Kelvin or something like that. It's huge. It's immense. Um, and um, yeah, well, you have a martensitic transition in iron nickel, but you can't use it as a shape memory alloy. That's the problem. It would have been wonderful, cheap. Yeah, everybody could use it. But no, it doesn't work. In the middle here, you have the Martensitic transition temperature. Uh, sorry, the um, the Martensitic transition, the region of the Martensitic transition t uh, region for uh, uh, gold cadmium. This is also a shape memory alloy, just like the ones I've shown you over here. And you can see that here you have a transition width of about 10 Kelvin which works, but it is also broad when it comes to technological applications. I mean, widths in the order of 10 Kelvin 
are pretty bad. I mean, you'd, you wouldn't want it. You can live with it, maybe. But with 300 Kelvin, you can't do anything. So when we're talking about hysteresis and the scale of the hysteresis where we're working in, in uh, be it uh, shape memory, be it magnetic shape memory, are in the order of uh, sometimes zero up to about 20 Kelvin or something like that. So what is the Martensitic transition? It's a, um, it's a diffusionless transition. That means the atoms don't move around. They keep their neighborhood. If the atoms were, moved to, were to move around, uh, then you could think of order-disorder transitions, for example. Or you could think of um, decomposition processes. So that's where you have to have the atoms moving around. But in these kinds of transitions, where you have no diffusion, the atoms move collectively. They call them military transitions, the other civil transitions. So here, we have an austenite state. It's a square state, let's say. And then you have here a, a state which is more like a parallelogram, you have a distortion. The atoms don't lose their local um, neighborhood. The local neighborhood is always the same. It's somehow um, distorted. It's a distortive transition. It can also be displaced. They can shear. I've got two examples of this. So we have the austenite here. This is the martensite. We have here what could be called as a habit plane. This habit plane becomes the twin boundary. So what you have is when you come from this phase to this phase, you can't have the whole sample moving in all in one direction. That would be energetically uh, very uh, expensive, I would say. So what they do is uh, the material forms twins, like this here. Okay, with a twin boundary. In some cases, you have uh, accommodation problems. So what happens is that then, uh, since this cannot be accommodated in this because this costs a lot of energy, these all slip. So you have these uh, various kinds of shears and things like that going on in these in these kinds of transitions. So whenever we talk about Martensitic transitions, we are talking about twinning. Okay. We're talking about twins moving, twin boundary motion. So we'll always be talking about twinning and things. What did we do here in the examples that I showed? Okay. Um, this is, uh, that's back in its Martensite state almost. But not exactly. It's, it's, it's a pretty good. So we start from an austenite state. I drew here. Um, um, red and blue circles just to talk about um, uh, just to show that they're not the same atoms it doesn't happen in one system but it's uh, <clears throat> you have two, two different atoms of this so you have the austenite state and so what do we do from the austenite state uh, this, these are the, uh, the various temperatures again the martensite start, martensite finish austenite start and austenite finish we cool the system, and what happens? We come into a twinned martensite state. So after we come into the twin martensite state, I just lost my paper clip, but it's okay. Uh, but I have a, a something else over here. This is the letter R, okay? You can move it around. And so uh, now it's no longer a letter R, it's something else, okay? Um, so when we come from this state, from the high temperature state to this state, we can move things around. What does moving things around mean? People talk about deformation, but this is not a deformation. Okay? Deformation is something else. I'm going to be coming to that as well. So, if we... Uh, if we warm this thing back up again, It comes back to its original shape. It's an R. Maybe you can see from here. Okay. If you look in this direction, then it's a Russian back R. 
So um, we heat it back up, uh, up and down. But when we're deforming this, now it's cold again, so I can deform it. What we're def doing is that, this way, oh yeah, okay. We're going from the twin martensite state to the detwin martensite state. We're moving around twin boundaries. Okay, they're very easy to move. So uh, bending this is not bending it, it's moving around twin boundaries. It, it's not a deformation, we're not deforming. Deforming means that you're introducing um, irregularities, uh, slips, um, vacancies, and what dislocations and what other things like that. This is not a deformation in that sense. It's not a deformation at all, in fact. So from the deformed state, if we go to the uh, I'm using the wrong thing, here. if we heat it back up again, then it goes back into its original shape. So this is the process that we were seeing. Now. Uh, I think I'll give the break over here, and then I'll go into superplasticity. And then what I want to talk about is that well, all these pictures I show here, um, they're very nicely single crystalline, yeah? Uh, this big brass thing, well, that was also single crystalline. But nickel titanium is polycrystalline, so how does this work, okay? And how is it that nickel titanium is a wonder material that it has a shape memory effect in its polycrystalline form? It doesn't necessarily have to be a single crystal, whereas everything else seems to have to be a single crystal. Okay, so, yes? Uh, up to how many areas the material can shape? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Um, yes, uh, how many times can I bend it before it breaks, yeah? Yes. Ah, uh, it's not a wire shape in the beginning. Um, there must be something. Yes. So you you have a wire, okay? I brought that too. This is the original shape. This is the wire. This is nickel titanium in its, in its austenite state, okay? If I bend it, it becomes martensite. If I let loose of it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's austenite. Then I have the... Uh I don't know what I did with it. I had the paper clip over here. Okay. Now the paper clip is, is also a wire, but it's, it has a certain shape. So the thing is, how do you give this shape in the beginning? So uh, this is why I brought the wire. I wanted to give a shape. I'll do that in the next lecture, okay? So I, I'm going, um, we're talking about dislocations and deformations and giving shapes. And I wanted to do a live experiment over here on how to uh, make a spring out of that wire, for example, okay? Now let's go back to the question. The question is, how do we give it a shape? So, uh, well, then let me ask you, what is shape? Okay, what do we mean by shape? We can acquire shape with several methods. The one that comes into my mind is that you can, um, you can melt, some metal and then pour it into a mold and you get a shape, okay? So that's one way of getting a shape. Um, there are lots of ways. And another way of giving a shape is, is, is by deforming something. Here, we gave this a shape, yeah? This was straight and we bent it. So it's no longer straight. 
So what happened to it? <clears throat> when we bent it, we introduced dislocations and other defects. So a certain dislocation field defines a shape. It's some kind of a field. It's a configuration of dislocations. So this is shape. When we're bending around martensite, we're not creating dislocations. We're causing twin boundaries to move around, and it looks as if we were causing dislocations. So this is not a deformation. It's um, if deformation means, of course, if what I understand by deformation is creating um, dislocations. This is cold now. The same thing with this. Uh, now I can move the twins around and mess up my spring again. Okay? But who gave this, this shape in the beginning? And how do we do it? So for that, I have a demonstration, so let's do it together. Okay? So we have to create a new deformation field. This is a wire, it's nickel titanium, okay? If I wind this around in the form of a spring, it won't stay as a spring, it stretches back out again, okay? It's super elastic. So this is what we mean by super elasticity here. On the left side, what we have is the martensitic transformation, temp the characteristic temperatures, MS, MF, AS, and AF. So, what happens is that when we are um, introducing a stress to this thing, we're shifting the martensitic transition temperature. And how are we doing that? So let's look at the martensite start temperature. They all shift the same, so we'll, check, we'll check, take this one. So at zero stress, if the transition temperature is somewhere around here, at finite applied stress, it goes up along this curve. So it increases and increases. And what happens is that if you apply stress to an austenite in the austenite state, the temperature at which you are at will sometime, at some time, correspond to the martensitic transition temperature, and it will become martensite. So these regions which you see around here, they're all martensite. And if I let this loose, then the transition temperature is back here again, and that corresponds to the austenite state. So what we have here is this phenomenon called superelasticity by inducing martensite by applying a stress. But we can't deform it. You see, I, mean, we, 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 I, I did all sorts of things. I mean, it won't deform. Yeah? So we have to do something else to deform this and to, and to give it a shape. Um, this here is basically um, the strain dependence of the stress. So um, originally, what I have to do is um, I bend this, and um, to bend it, you have to have apply some kind of a force to this thing. And it gets to a point uh, where um, the amount of stress that you need for a given strain um, is, uh, doesn't cost you anything. So the, the, the stress is always constant. Uh, it's not like the Hooke's Law. The Hooke's Law tells us that the force is proportional to the square of the distance that you need. Here, uh, in the beginning it may be so, but then um, as you um, apply more stress, you get strained for the same stress. And this made a very good application um, in dentistry. Um, what you find today in dentistry, the, uh, the braces that you have on your teeth are nickel titanium or nickel titanium based alloys. So um, what you had to do before when they used uh, stainless steel is, is when you um, applied force to the, to the braces, um, then the teeth would go back, so, but they would loosen. So every week you had to go to the dentist yeah, to, to get them uh, uh, readjusted again. With these things, you don't get them readjusted. Um, you apply them once, and then you wait for two months. It always acts with the same force. As the teeth go back, you still have the same force on it, and things work. So it's, it's used very, very uh, standardly in, 
in orthodonty. I don't know, maybe some of you have already had that experience. So um, this is super elasticity. Now, um, if we want to give this a shape, we have to deform it. And let's see if we can do this. So I brought another experiment here. What I have is, is just a bolt and I am going to fasten this wire between these two bolts. For that, I have my own. I brought these things around. Okay, so this is fastened at this end. Now, uh, I have to give this thing a form. So I'm winding it. Just have to know that I'm winding it in the right direction. Oh yeah. Wrong direction. Now it's the right direction. So I'm winding this thing, thing, thing round and round and round. If I let loose, it'll go back and be straight again. So I have to clamp this. So this is now also clamped from, from this side. Why is this thing going back into a straight wire when I let loose? It's because um, I'm still way out here some, uh, somehow. I mean, I, uh, it's uh, uh, the, uh, I, when, when, I, when I bend it, now the whole thing is martensite, and the martensitic transition temperature of this thing has gone up somewhere, and uh, it has to get to a point where I have to go above um, any uh, possible temperature that it can be martensite. So what I have to do next is I have to heat this. Um, I think I can do that there. What you usually do is you heat this up to about 450, 500 degrees centigrade, and you let it sit there for about 15 minutes or so. Okay, I don't have that much time. I'm going to do it a little bit uh, faster and things like that. It's not going to be perfect, but I'll show you what the thing, what happens is that uh, I have to sort of Five hundred degrees centigrade is is a temperature where things start to glow. They become very, very pale red. You gotta see what I'm doing. Well, we've done something. <coughs> Let's see how much this is done with this amount of heating. The te if the temperature was high enough, then we'll get a spring. If it's not, then we'll get a back a straight line. Do you have to take my word for it that it works if I put this into a furnace, okay? <laughs> So, uh, uh, kind of, but 
Let's see now. Well, yes, something has happened. <laughs> it didn't go to a string now. But it also didn't become the best spring in the world, of course. <laughs> this is the degree of our success, <laughs> okay? I'll give you this wire so you can, if you have a furnace over here, you can do the same thing. I'll leave you, sir. You just put it in there to 500 degrees centigrade, and you leave it there uh, for about an hour or so, and you'll get something better. But as you see, it's no longer straight, and it has a shape. It has another shape. We've given it a funny shape, but uh, the sort of answers your question, maybe. Yeah? So this is what you have to do to give it a shape. We've given the shape. We've introduced our dislocations. We have new dislocation fields. And uh, the dislocation field um, <coughs> defines our new shape. I found my paperclip. That's why our paperclip has this shape as well. Okay. So <coughs> now we've been talking in terms of single crystals. Um, but single crystals are expensive to grow in things. I mean, if you're going to have to work with single crystals on these things, then you're going to have a problem. So, but nickel titanium is an amazing material. And so far I know, it's practically the only useful one um, that can be used in applications and is a polycrystalline material at the same time. So, what happens in the single crystal? Well, single, uh, in the polycrystal, in the polycrystal, I have sort of a, uh, a sketch over here of how the thing may look like in the austenite and martensite phases, the dislocations. I've, I've uh, symbolized the dislocations with these little red lines here. Yeah, they're all over the place. So let's, but I mean, each um, shape has its own dislocation field. So when you go into the martensite state, um, without moving around the twins and things like that, what you have is you've moved these dislocations with you. The local coordination of the atoms don't change. The local neighborhood doesn't change. If you have slips or if you have dislocations or if you have screw dislocations or whatever you may have, you carry that along with you into the martensite state because there's no diffusion. It's locally, the dislocation may have another uh, orientation, let's say, um, but within the uh, crystal or, the, or the, within the grain itself, the dislocation, the, the local neighborhood of the dislocation doesn't change. And since that doesn't change, when you heat this back up, you get the same shape because you don't do anything with the dislocation field. Now, so you, you cool this, you come down here, you have the same dislocations. Where do you have these dislocations? You have it in the crystal structure. What do these crystal structures make up? They make up these twins, yeah? You have the twinning because of the martensitic transition. And these those dislocations are located in these twins at the same time. So they don't go anywhere, they're, they're there. If I move around the, uh, the twins, I move around the dislocations along with them. So if I... Um, move around the twins as I'm doing here with the uh, with the paper clip. Um, the paper clip, uh, the, uh, the, I've moved around the twin boundaries and the dislocations were carried along with them. So that's why when you heat it back up, you get your paper clip back again. So this is the shape memory effect, basically. Um, People have worked a lot in looking for other materials that can show this effect just as efficiently as a nickel titanium. It's been many, many years. I really haven't heard of anything. 
Not really. And the same thing is going to come with nickel manganese gallium and the magnetic shape memory. Somebody found that and people have looked for others. Uh -uh. Uh, these are things in nature that are stuck somewhere, like the Bitcoin, yeah? And uh, you just have to find them. So um, these are various uh, stress strain diagrams that sort of um, give a better notion of uh, what the, uh, the stress and the strain are doing at various temperatures below and above the transformation temperatures. Uh, this is uh, a copper zinc uh, alloy. It's a single crystal alloy. Copper zinc tin. That's a composition of this thing that I just showed you over here. So this has uh, an MS temperature of uh, 221 Kelvin, MF, AS, and AF at 235, okay? So uh, let's look, not this way, but let's look from this direction. Um, 350 Kelvin. Uh, it's, everything's in the Martensite, uh, in the Austinite state, okay? It's just like our, uh, our wire now and uh, we can bend it, we get our, sh uh, sh um, our shape back again. So what happens is in the, um, uh, the stress-strain diagram is that uh, we bend it and we, the stress recovers almost completely. Yeah? And as long as, we, as long as we're in the austenite state, austenite 235, 235 MS, if we're coming from 221, yes, I mean, you, you see initially over here that uh, you have this initial increase and then you have the, uh, the plateau and after which everything goes back to its original state. Now when you go below the Martensitic temperature, um, 221, what happens is that you start losing this initial steep rise, okay? The initial steep rise um, that you have over here is to uh, get the thing moving into the martensite state. But once into the martensite state, then you don't require that much force anymore to move further the, the twin boundaries. So what happens here when you're down here at 234, let's see, MS is 221, this initial steep rise, it diminishes. And what happens is that it doesn't recover. It goes up and then it goes down, it's in another shape. So this is how the uh, the shape recovery effect works. And um, working in this field, you'll be doing a lot of stress strain stuff, especially if you go into engineering. And um, these are the kinds of diagrams that we uh, talk about. Now, um, I'm coming into a point which I will be mainly dealing with as of tomorrow, but I want to show you another very interesting aspect for, of nickel titanium next to the shape memory effect, again taking advantage of the Martensitic transition that is in there. And this is the so-called elastocaloric effect. Now here we have a wire of titanium. I attached a thermocouple to it and just connected that to a, uh, a thermometer, so to speak. So let's see if this, um, this is not gonna work on this computer. So, uh, I mean, actually, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little hint of what is happening over here. You see that the temperature is 19 degrees, okay? When you bend this very rapidly, it goes instantaneously up to 26 degrees. Because there's a huge difference, about 7 degrees. So if you wait there and let it um, get back to room temperature almost, and you let loose, then it goes down to about 17 degrees, 16 degrees. So you got an air conditioner, okay? Or a refrigerator, or a heater, or whatever you want, yeah? By the elastocaloric uh, effect. And this is uh, being, uh, today it's uh, being vastly investigated. Uh, we have a big project going on in Germany on these things, on magnetocaloric effects, elastocaloric effects, electrocaloric effects, barocaloric effects, so, uh, and, uh, people want to get rid of uh, gas compression refrigeration, environmentally unfriendly, and so on. Okay, anyhow. So, uh, the next part, before I um, 
end, I just want to sort of recapitulate a few things on uh, nucleation and, <clears throat> and growth. Um, we are dealing with solid-solid transitions, and solid-solid transitions are usually homogeneous. It's a homogeneous form of nucleation and growth. You have a, uh, uh, your modernzite nuclei occurring, then growing, and then growing again. Uh, you don't need another surface or you don't need another defect on which <coughs> the martensite can grow, although it would be helpful, of course, that's another thing. The other kind of nucleation we have is heterogeneous nucleation. Heterogeneous nucleation is the more common nucleation that um, um, requires um, less energy to grow, but there you need a surface, okay? So if you have... Um, um, I don't know what example to give you at the moment, but I mean, I was thinking of liquid nitrogen. No, I was thinking of water. If you take water and if you pour liquid nitrogen into it, it freezes. The water freezes. But it starts freezing on the walls and not in the inside. Okay? Um, so this is, this, this is the, uh, the, uh, the difference between homogeneous nucleation and heterogeneous nucleation. You can get a glass of soda water. You have bubbles coming out. Yeah? And why do you have bubbles coming out only from one place? You know, you look at it, and bubbles always come out from one place. Because in the beginning, you had some defects over here, which is convenient for the nucleation to start occurring. And then since the solution is super saturated, when you open your soda bottle or your Coke or whatever, you pour it into the glass, uh, those sites uh, are convenient for nucleation. You have the bubbles always coming out from the same position here. Yeah? And then if you would do something that you would never do to your glass of water or Coke is pour a little bit of sand into your liquid, yeah? What happens as the sand falls in, you start having new bubbles coming out all over the sands because the sand are nucleation uh, centers. Just like rain, you have some particles in the clouds, you'll, you'll have some rain, you'll have some places of nucleation. So um, this is our homogeneous nucleation picture. We have... Uh, some atoms trying to come together, and then if they come, to, if they can come together and form a critical size or something, um, until they form a critical size, they jump on and off um, the nucleation center, and then they hang on, and then they start growing. Okay, so um, these are just to recapitulate what the energies are, what the free energies are. Uh, these are uh, things that you're probably more familiar with. We have. Um, in the case of homogeneous nucleation, um, we have some kind of a solid. The solid has some kind of a surface, and it has some kind of a volume, and we have a liquid around it. I mean, it could be liquid, it could be solid, solid, that doesn't matter. And if we look at the, um, uh, the, uh, the change, uh, the difference in the Gibbs free energy uh, um, of, of, uh, the, uh, of the solid and the liquid, uh, we find here that the, uh, from the volume, this is the volume portion, we have um, the volume of the liquid and the volume of the solid, and then we have its surface, okay? And these are the two contributions to the, <clears throat> um, to, to the, to, to the free energy. So then if you... Um, <clears throat> plot this out, um, in a first order phase transition, when you plot out the free energy versus the temperature, uh, the transformation temperature is here. This would be the equilibrium transformation temperature, but you never have an equilibrium transformation temperature, right? Um, in the case of martensite and austenite, you have a hysteresis. If you take the middle of the hysteresis, that would be probably the thermodynamic equilibrium transition temperature, but you never see that. You have to undercool it or you have to superheat it. And it's the same thing that you're doing over here. So you need this much delta G energy, which you acquire from the system itself, so that you transform into the other phase. So we have here the liquid phase, solid phase. Uh, you have something like this, a discontinuity here, okay? And delta G is referred to as the driving force, although it doesn't have anything to do with the force. I don't know why it was named like that, but we live with it. Um, it's actually energy, but we call it a driving force. So this is the driving force 
that is necessary for the transition to occur. If you leave a, a glass of water in the, uh, at a freezing temperature for a long period of time, the water will go below zero, it will just keep on cooling and cooling, but it won't turn liquid until um, it finds a way of nucleating. You can stick something into it or stir it around a bit, then it, um, it freezes. So this is the amount of energy that is required for the, uh, for the nucleation process to start. Um, we have here the, the volume part and the area part. And this is the radius and this is the energy. So what happens over here, in the case of homogeneous nucleation, you have, um, if you add these two, you have a curve which looks like this. So when you're here at these distances, what is happening is that your nucleation process is going on, uh, but it's not, um, it's not forming a critical size. It has to form a critical size before it can um, uh, be stable. And when it comes to this much, when you provide it this much energy, which is actually the driving force, then you're at a critical radius over here, and that is a critical radius for the formation of the new phase. And after that, things start going downhill so that it's more energetically favorable for your other phase to occur. Now, homogeneous het uh, nucleation, heterogeneous nucleation, um, uh, well, the processes are this basically the same, except you, if you have another surface, if you have another impurity, then this energy that you need, this delta G here, this is the homogeneous, the red line is the homogeneous nucleation, so you need a lot of energy or a lot of undercooling if you have no contact uh, with any surfaces. And in the case of heterogeneous nucleation, it takes place much quicker. So this is basically uh, what I wanted to introduce you to today. Um, many of you may have seen some of this or some of this or maybe all of it or something like that, but at least um, I uh, hope that I have been able to show you a few things giving you uh, a feeling of what kind of forces are involved in these martin zwick transitions and uh, how they can be useful in various applications. Tomorrow we'll go on into then to magnetic shape memory and uh, uh, I'll try to show you these other movies along with that as well. So thank you very much for today. When you are giving a shape to something, then uh, you are applying both stress and temperature simultaneously. Both? Both stress and temperature simultaneously. Uh, when you're giving the shape? Yeah. Yes, yes. The and reason. that's no phase transition. We're not changing the temperature. We're changing the transition temperature. Okay, when we apply stress. So here we are. Uh, this is the wire, okay? So. When I'm bending this, let alone the uh, magnetocaloric effect, when I'm bending this isothermally, okay, what am I doing? I'm putting it into the Martensite state. That means room temperature corresponds to a temperature which is below the Martensitic transition temperature. When I let loose, then room temperature is above the Martensite transformation temperature, right? So um, I can't deform it because the stress strain curve does not allow me to deform it. I have to go into the plastic deformation limit to deform it. Deformation means plastic deformation, okay? And at room temperature, I have no chance of deforming this. I may, let me try it, okay. Wow, if I go to, well, not even that. It's, it's very difficult. I can deform it maybe a little bit, but I, I mean, um, I, I really can't. So, but. Uh, so I have to go um, <clears throat> to a point where room temperature is very, very, very below the, uh, the transformation temperature, okay? Only then can, it, can I give it a, a strain. And for that to occur, I have to heat it up. I have to heat it up and introduce the... Uh, uh, the strain, because the high temperature has to correspond to the austenite state if I want to give it a shape. Is that okay? Okay. 
Next is, uh, suppose you have a straight line, you are giving it a shape of square, then after that, you are giving it a shape of circle. Okay, now you are hitting it up. So, uh, what shape will it take? Uh, the square one or the straight line? It'll remain as a circle. Because it's that the last deformation field that I created was a circle. Yeah. The circle is a shape. And the circle has a certain deformation. It's forgotten that it was a square or a straight line. It's gone. Finished. It, it cannot be memorized. No. Then, when I take the circle, if I cool it down to below the martin zittig transition temperature, I can move around the twins and I can uh, give it another shape without changing the deformation field. If I warm it back up to room temperature, it'll be a circle again. If I clamp it in the form of uh, an ellipse or something like that, take it up to high temperature and anneal it, take it back down, then it'll be an ellipse. Then it'll forget. The only way that it will forget is if you go up to high temperature and introduce a new dislocation field. Then it will forget. Okay? So thanks for the nice lecture. Uh, you have only mentioned the heating effect of uh, all these things. Uh, what will happen when we uh, lower the temperature? Is it any uh, some sort of change in the wire or uh, something else? Um, <clears throat> heating? Um, you mean um, you mean by moving around the twin boundaries? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean th this is. Okay, this is low temperature now. Okay. It's a low temperature. But if you go, go uh, beyond the low temperature. Ah, if you go below, yeah, further yeah. down, it'll yeah. be the same. Okay. It'll be but the same. Is going to no, happen. no, no. Once you're in the Martensite state, there's very, very little difference in whether you go down to very, very low temperature or uh, you're just below the Martensitic transformation temperature. There is a temperature dependence of the, uh, of the twin boundary motion, of the mobility of the twin boundaries, of course, but that's uh, insignificant as of for, the, uh, for the shape memory effect. And then if you heat this back up, of course, it goes back into its old form, so you can take it down. Thanks. Thanks. Yes.